Greetings, friends and brethren. This is Dr. Bob Teal for Continuing Church of God. Could you recognize Jesus Christ? When Jesus comes, will you know it's Jesus? Well, will Jesus Christ actually be called Antichrist by a lot of people? You know, the Bible says that when Jesus returns, people are going to fight against him. The nations are going to be angry when he comes, and they're going to fight against him. Why? Why will people not know Jesus Christ? You know, Jesus Christ's name is well known throughout the world. Yeah, there are people who haven't heard of the name, but generally speaking, uh, quite a few have. You know, there are approximately two billion people who claim to be Christian. Will most of them not know who Jesus Christ is and who returns? And if not, why not? Well, there's different reasons. One of the issues that we're going to see is that as we get closer to the time of the end, you've got various groups, for example, some of the evangelical Protestant groups, who believe that they don't need to worry about Antichrist or things such as that because they believe Jesus will rapture them up before the Great Tribulation, uh, uh, before the time of the reign of uh, the beast and the Antichrist. But does the Bible teach that? I'm not going to go into all that at this time. We have another uh, video at the Continuing uh, COG channel that you can watch about that. And we also have an article at the www.cogwriter.com website on why the idea that Jesus is going to come and rapture uh, Christians away prior to the Great Tribulation is not true. But ignoring that, let's go further. Now, most Protestants, or at least a lot of them, don't tend to believe the rapture, or they don't believe in it as much as they used to, and a lot of Protestant groups never believed it in the first place. And then you also have groups like the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholic Church who don't teach anything that sounds like a pre-tribulation rapture. That's simply not in their doctrine. But what do they teach? And does Satan have a plan? If Satan does have a plan, how's he been the plan being carried out? How's he been used this plan for a long time? Well, I'd like to talk about some of Satan's plan in terms of why people will not recognize when Jesus Christ returns. I'm going to go through a lot of uh, Catholic and uh, Eastern Orthodox prophecies. And between that and looking at the Scripture, you should get a pretty good idea why many people, actually most people, will fight against Jesus Christ when he returns. They will not recognize the one that many today call their Savior. Well, here's uh, something I'd like to start off with from an approved Catholic prophetess. Her name was uh, Jeanne uh, Leroy. In the 18th century, uh, she's known as a sister of the Nativity. In the 18th century, she wrote, One day the Lord said to me, so she claimed that God gave her a message, that Jesus Christ gave her a message, which... I do not believe this is, came from Jesus. It says, A few years before the coming of my enemy, Satan will rise up false prophets who will announce Antichrist as the true Messiah. So she's saying somewhere before uh, the end, Satan's going to have prophets rise up which will say Antichrist is the true Messiah. Well, I'm not going to go there right now, but if you go into Revelation chapter 11, you're going to find out that God is going to have two witnesses. These two witnesses are going to get a message out of the world. And part of that message is that Jesus Christ is going to return uh, uh, after the, uh, the day of the, uh, during the, after the tribulation, day of the Lord, the three and a half, that three and a half year period time, the great tribulation. And I believe this is actually a prophecy against the two witnesses. Furthermore, it says... They will try to destroy all our Christian beliefs. Now, Christian beliefs should come from this book, the Bible. We actually have a booklet at uh, the Continuing uh, Church of God called Continuing History of the Church of God, which you can get free online. In one part of it, we've got a chart, a variety of early beliefs that the Greco-Roman Protestant churches used to have, or at least some of their so-called saints used to have. Some of them uh, were Church of God saints that they no longer have. So if you want more information about what Christian beliefs were based on this book and historically what they used to be. So the two witnesses are likely going to point out errors in professing Christianity. Yet uh, the sister of the Nativity said that uh, they, they're satanic. Now, I'd like to read another one. This is from Legenda 
Aurea. This is from the 12th century. So it's a long time ago. He says, uh, it says that the last judgment is going to be preceded by the imposter Antichrist. By false exposition of scriptures, he will try to prove he is the Messiah promised by the law. So there's a prophecy from the 12th century that says the Antichrist is going to use this book in order, in order to try to claim that uh, he's, he's the Messiah. Well, you know, when Jesus was here, why don't you go to John 5, 39? When Jesus was here, what did he do? He said that this book proved that he was the Messiah. Uh, Jesus' words, John 5, 39. He says, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. So he's talking about people who think they're in a true church back then. And he says, and these are they which testify of me. So Jesus says, look, the Bible testifies about me. And the words in here apply, apply to me when they're directly applicable or whatever. So Jesus said, look, this is the book that you can prove whether or not I'm the Messiah or not. And so we've got a prophecy from the 12th century that says when the Antichrist comes, he's supposedly going to pick up and say from this book, you can prove he's the Messiah. Uh, I think, they, I think a lot of people have been confused. Now, is the seventh day Sabbath a sign of the Antichrist? Well, some seem to think it is. There was a Catholic Pope, uh, known as, usually known as Gregory the Great. He died in 604 AD. And here's what he wrote. He said, Gregory, servant of the servants of God, to his most beloved sons, the Roman citizens, it's come to my ears that certain men of perverse spirit have sown among you some things that are wrong and opposed to the holy faith. So what I'm going to read, he says, they're wrong and they're opposed to the holy faith. So as to forbid any work to be done on the Sabbath day. Well, we could go to Exodus chapter 20. It says, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but seventh day is the Sabbath day. The eternal your God, and you're not supposed to do any work. But he says this is... Uh, this is wrong. He says, what else can I call these but preachers of Antichrist? This is in his uh, Registrum Apostolarum, book uh, 13, letter 1. And by the way, most of the quotes are, that I'm going to be going through today are in an article that's at the www.cogwriter.com website. So you can determine... Uh, for yourself or look at the, the references yourself to, to determine the validity and potentially uh, the applicability, some of which I want to go into today. Now, there's more Catholic prophecies. Here's one from uh, Dionysus of Luxembourg, who died in 1682. Antichrist will teach that Saturday is to be observed instead of Sunday. Now, you see that in the Bible? The, is it so Antichrist supposedly is going to teach that you're supposed to go to church on Saturday. That's what this one's saying. Here's another one. This is from uh, Catholic Saint Hildegard. And she died in 1179. Antichrist, his doctrine of faith will be taken from the Jewish religion and seemingly will not differ much from the fundamental beliefs of Christianity. For he will teach there is one God who created the world who rewards the obeyers of his commands and trespassers he chastises, who will raise all from the dead in due time. This God has spoken through Moses, therefore the precepts of Mosaic law are to be kept, especially circumcision and the keeping of the Sabbath. So this is again another warning from a, this is from a Catholic saint who said Antichrist is going to tell people they have to keep the Sabbath. Now here's something from a Catholic uh, writer and a priest by the name of... Uh, Kuchide from the 19th century. This is a claim here. This is from a book called uh, History of Antichrist with an imprimatur. Anyway, it says, After having weakened the faith of Christ to the minds and hearts of many, he, their claim is his Antichrist, will proceed to show that the law of Moses still prevails. He will reestablish the Sabbath in all legal observances. He will invite the Jews to reestablish their nationality, after which he will declare himself the true Messiah. He will endeavor to prove the truth of his assertion from Scripture. Here's another one. 
saying, look, he's going to try to prove things from the Bible. Well, that's where we should be trying to prove our doctrine. He will declare his design as rebuilding Jerusalem and temple and of bringing the whole world under his uh, dominion. According to St. Cyril of Jerusalem, he will win the esteem and attachment of mankind by his unbounded kindness. Well, Jesus will be kind. He'll work all kinds of miracles. Jesus will do that. He'll therefore appear to as performing miracles similar to all those wrought by Jesus Christ. That would be logical, since Jesus Christ will be returning. Now here's a claim. Antichrist being a Jew will be circumcised. He will observe Mosaic law. Then by the order of the tyrant, they're calling him a tyrant, the continual sacrifice will be abolished. The holy sacrifice of mass will no longer be offered publicly on the altars. Now, do you think Jesus, when he comes, would have the, the, the sacrifice of mass that's done in the Greco-Roman church, uh, the church of Rome every day? The Bible says that Jesus was supposed to be sacrificed once in the book of Hebrews, but they sacrifice him every day, or at least they think that's what they're doing. Anyway, their, this warning is that uh, sacred vessels will be desecrated and the priests will be scattered. And it appears certain that the Roman Empire will be completely demolished by Antichrist. He'll substitute another in its place. Well, you read the book of Revelation, and you see, no, the Antichrist power supports the, the final Roman Empire, but that Jesus is the one who's going to come and put an end to it. Now, I'm going to go to the Bible, Luke 4, uh, starting verse 14. It says, Jesus returned in the power of the, of the Spirit to Galilee. He taught in the synagogues, came up to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up. And his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. Jesus kept the Sabbath. Now some will say, well, that was because uh, he hadn't uh, been killed and resurrected yet. These laws were still in effect. True. But did they, the Sabbath law get done away with after Jesus was resurrected? Uh, no. I'd like to read something from the original uh, Rheims New Testament. This is the Catholic uh, approved translation of the Latin Vulgate into English. This is Hebrews chapter 4. I'm going to read uh, starting in verse... I'm going to read part of verse 4 and verse 9. Now, if you're following along with one of the Protestant translations, let me forewarn you, if you're looking at the King James or the New King James Version of the Bible, they have a mistranslation there. It's correct in the NIV, but it's these other two translations I just mentioned are an error. So anyway, Hebrews 4, verse 4 from the New Testament, the, the Catholic Version, For he said in a certain place of the seventh day thus, and God rested the seventh day from all his works. Verse 9. Therefore, there is left a sabbatisme for the people of God. So sabbatisme means actually keeping the Sabbath for the people of God. Some translators have intentionally not translated that correctly, but that's what it means. Sabbath was not done away with. It's the seventh day. The Catholic Bible says it's the seventh day. Protestant Bible says it's the seventh day. When Jesus comes, he's going to keep the seventh day. But we've got Catholic prophecy saying the seventh day is the day of the Antichrist. And that's simply not the case. Now, the Eastern Orthodox uh, have some prophecies as well. They're concerned about Sabbath keepers toward the time of the end. And this is from their blessed Hieronymus Agathagelos, 1279. So many centuries old. He says, Lo, an evil assembly of the crafty leader, dressed in black mourning apparel, those who were taking in the most hypocritical manner the most holy name of Christ, those are the most filthy citizens of Pentapolis, or the five cities. These are semi-godless men. They will have to pay the price before the public executioner of the Sabbateans, or the Sabbath keepers. So there's an Eastern Orthodox prophecy that toward the time of the end, that Sabbath keepers are going to be killed. Now, why would this happen? A lot of people profess Jesus Christ. I'm going to go to John chapter 15. Uh, 
verse, it looks like this is verse uh, 18, says, If the world hates you, you know it hated me before it hated you. And Jesus goes through various things. He says, verse 20, If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. Now Jesus kept the Sabbath. We have a Eastern Orthodox prophecy or Greek Orthodox prophecy that says that the people who keep the Sabbath are going to be executed. Why? Verse 21. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they did not know him who sent me. The reality is, a lot of people don't know the Father. They don't know the Bible. And because of this, they're going to do things that they should not do. Now, there are a variety of Catholic writers who believe that the Antichrist is going to be a Jew with Jewish practices. Here's one from uh, Cardinal John Henry Newman from the 19th century. Antichrist will pretend to be the Messiah. It is of old the received notion he was to be of Jewish race and observe Jewish rites. Here's one from Emmett Culligan, the Culligan Man. This is from a book from 1966 that he got blessed by uh, Pope Paul VI. It says the Antichrist is going to be a Jew by race and religion. Here's something from Francisco Suarez who died in 1617. Antichrist will be born of Jewish extraction and profess the Jewish religion. And here's another one from the uh, Catholic Saint Hildegard of Bingham, Sweden, 12th century. And this way, the son of perdition will practice his deceitful arts on the elements and show in them the beauty and sweetness and delight desired by those he deceives. He'll show them his treasures, his riches, allow them to feast, confirm his teaching by deceitful signs. He will command them to observe circumcision and Jewish laws and customs. Now here's a Catholic pro prophetic writing from Frederick William Faber, who died in 1863. Antichrist, certainly a Jew, begins affecting respect for the law of Moses. Jerusalem will be his metropolitan. While it's remotely possible that Antichrist will be a Jew, we don't have to go there, but uh, John 4, verse uh, 9 and 10 says that Jesus was a Jew. And you can also look at this genealogy in Matthew 1 or uh, Luke, uh, Luke 3. Now, Jesus kept so-called Jewish practices like the Sabbath. You also see that in Luke 13, 10. He kept the Passover, Matthew 16, 18. He kept the Feast of Tabernacles, as it shows in John chapter 7. So he had practices of the Jewish religion. And the early followers of, of him did as well. Interestingly, you go to the book of Zechariah in the Old Testament, I should probably mention that after Jesus comes, the Feast of Tabernacles is going to be kept. Will not people say, ah, these are Jewish practices. I look at this must be the Antichrist. Well, if they were familiar with what their Bible says, they'd understand that no, Jesus would be doing these things. Verse 3 of Zechariah 14. Then the Eternal will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights the day of the battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives is going to be split in two. So Jesus is going to come back to the Mount of Olives, which is in Jerusalem, a place I have visited. Going down to verse 16, it's going to come to pass that everyone's left of the nations, which came against Jerusalem. So people are going to fight against Jesus. But eventually, they're going to come up year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, Yahweh, to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Do you keep the Feast of Tabernacles now? If you're in the Church of God, you probably do. If you're not, you probably don't. There are exceptions to that, of course. But notice that this is what's going to happen after Jesus returns. These are practices that the uh, Church of Rome doesn't keep, the Eastern Orthodox don't keep, and generally speaking, the Protestants don't keep. So we know that's going to happen. I'd like to read something that the, uh, the, the Dewey Old Testament, which is a Catholic translation of the uh, Latin Vulgate into English, here's what they say about, it says about Zechariah 14 from our commentary. In the meantime, such as before persecuted the church shall be converted, and with great devotion will celebrate the festivities and exercise religious rites to God's honor, and shall merit great rewards. So even... Catholic commentary realizes that these festivals are going to be kept. Now, they didn't put the word Feast of Tabernacles here, but that's what the Bible says, the Scripture says, it talks about that. 
And when that happens, some are going to say, at first, when Jesus comes and says, keep the peace of the tabernacles, they're going to say, no, no, that can't be Jesus. That's the Antichrist, because they're going to say, he's a Jew, he's telling us to do Jewish type things, as opposed to biblical things. A, a so-called Saint Martin from the 4th century said that the Antichrist would first seize the empire of the East to have Jerusalem as a seat in the imperial capital. And that uh, both the city and the temple are to be rebuilt by him. But after Jesus comes, he's going to establish the millennial kingdom. And it is going to be based out of Jerusalem, or Zion. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 2, starting verse 3. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the eternal, to the house of God of Jacob. He'll teach us his ways. He'll walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the eternal, or Yahweh, from Jerusalem. So that's where Jesus' headquarters is going to be. But these prophecies are warning that that's where Antichrist's uh, capital will be. And he shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They'll beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. So Jesus is going to come and do things that various Catholic writings and prophecies warn against. They're saying the Antichrist is going to do these things. Well, you know the difference between Jesus and Antichrist when Jesus does return. Now, is Antichrist going to be for idols or against idols? Well, I would suggest, I'm not going to go into Revelation 13 at this time, but since Revelation 13 says that the Antichrist wants people to worship the image of the beast, Antichrist is going to be in favor of idols. But Catholic prophecy warns, and this is, Catholic, when I say Catholic prophecy, I'm also including Eastern Orthodox Catholics in this as well. Catholic prophecy warns that the Antichrist is going to be against idols. Even though Revelation 13 says the Antichrist is going to be for idols. Okay, here's one from uh, somebody called uh, St. Ephraim, who died in uh, 373, so he's a 4th century person. He says, At the time when the Antichrist shall come, there will be no calm on the earth. He will come as humble, meek, a hater, he will say, of unrighteousness, despising idols. This is a prophecy from the 4th century. Satan has had people affected for centuries. So back in the 4th century, there's a warning that supposedly Antichrist is going to be against idols. Well, we know Jesus would be against idols. because the second commandment. <laughs> should not bow down and worship before these idols. Yet, and Revelation 13 says Antichrist is going to have people bow down before these idols. As if Catholics are saying, hey, no, the Antichrist is going to be against idols. Now, he wasn't the only one to write this kind of stuff. Dionysius of Luxembourg, who I mentioned before, died in the 17th century, said Antichrist will be an iconoclast. What's an iconoclast? That's one against idols. According to this prophecy, he will teach that the Catholic religion is false. The Roman Catholic religion is false. Well, if you accept the Roman Catholic religion is true, you would, of course, have issues with that. I would say that if you look at the Bible, you would find out why there's various reasons that the Roman Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox Catholic religion are not the original faith. I mentioned this booklet before. I guess I'll, I'll show this again. If you want to find out what early Christians believed, based on not only the Bible, but early writings that are accepted by the Greek Orthodox, the Roman Catholics, and most Protestant scholars, if you want to know, you'll find out by going to this booklet, Who Has the True Christian Religion Today? Why we in the Continuing Church of God are faithful to it. And we're teaching what this says and why, and that others made changes that they should not have. Here's a, uh, another one from Hildegard. It says, Antichrist will ridicule the graces of the Catholic Church. And here's one from uh, Saint Anselm from 1109. While Antichrist reigns, he'll prohibit under the pain of death the offering of the holy sacrifice of the Mass. 
And I mentioned before, the book of Hebrews says that Jesus only saw he sacrificed once, yet through the so-called holy sacrifice of the Mass, various ones are sacrificing him supposedly every single day. Here's another Catholic writing. This is from uh, something that uh, Cardinal Newman wrote down. He talked about Theodora's studies, writing it against the iconoclasts, considering their proceedings, quote, the apostasy which must come first to the invasion of Antichrist. So there's a bunch of Catholic writings that warn that the Antichrist is going to get rid of idols. But your Bible says the Antichrist is going to put idols in. He's not going to, uh, he's not going to be opposed to idols. He's going to actually uh, uh, endorse them. You know, I guess let, let's, I wasn't planning on going there, but let, let, let's go ahead anyway. Let's just go to Revelation 13 just, just for a moment. Just to see here that when I say uh, the Antichrist is going to be for idols, it's not just something uh, I made up. But you can tell, uh, you can tell from the, from the Bible. Okay, Revelation 13, verse 11. We see this beast coming out of the earth. It's got uh, two horns, like a lamb, spoke like a dragon. This is talking about the Antichrist, and. Go down to verse 14. He decrees that those who dwell on the earth, he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he does, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the beast who was wounded and lived. So he's telling people to make idols. He's granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many who would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So right there, in your Bible, and Basically, it says the same thing in Catholic translations of Scripture, too. There's a warning that the Antichrist is going to tell people to you know, make idols and worship them. And there's penalties if you, don't, if you don't worship idols. Yet, Catholic prophecy is saying, oh no, when the Antichrist comes, he's going to get rid of idols. And that's simply not the case. You know, in John 4.24, Jesus taught that God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And the truth is, the Bible is opposed to idolatry and idols. Early Christians, by the way, did not have uh, statues of Jesus or crosses or Marian images and all that stuff. That, that, wasn't, that was not done. You know, even in the book of Revelation, Revelation 20 verse, excuse me, Revelation 2 verse 20 says that uh, I have some things against you because you allow servants to eat things sacrificed to idols. The Bible warns against idols throughout and Jesus would not uh, be in favor of idols. Apostle John in 1 John 5.21 said, Little children, keep yourself from idols. So the concern is, or the belief was, obviously, that some people wouldn't listen uh, to, and do that. Revelation 22, I probably should have read this, verse 15. Verse 14 says, Blessed are those who keep his commandments, which include don't, not having idols. But verse 15, But outside are dogs, sorcerers, sexually immoral, murderers, and idolaters. Okay? The last book of the Bible says, don't be an idolater. Yet, Catholic prophecies are warning against, saying that Antichrist is going to be against idols, but we know clearly that Jesus would be against idols. Now, there's something interesting I'd like to read from uh, the commentary on the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation from... Uh, annotations that are of the Apocalypse from the original and true Rheims New Testament of 1582. It says, Rome, being so great, so proud of the em empire and the destroyer of the saints, which is plainly spoken of that city. And, he's, and they go that Christ's special enemies, they were the sink of idolatry. And the false worship, and they had false worship of the pagan gods. Well, they did before, but they still have that going on in Rome today. So they know that this is going to happen with Rome. Now, as far as Revelation 17, I'd like to read uh, verse 14. It says, These, these are people who are going to be in Rome. Again, the Catholic commentary referred to Rome as Revelation 17. They have a different understanding of it, but at least they do say it's Rome. Anyway, verse 14, These will make war with the Lamb. So they're going to fight against Jesus Christ, who's called the Lamb here. 
and the Lamb will overcome them, for He is the Lord of Lord, King of Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and those who are with Him are called, chosen, and faithful. Will you be called, chosen, and faithful? What happens when there's more persecution? What happens is they want to kill you because you keep the Sabbath. Now, there's another doctrine that many believe that uh, the Antichrist will hold. And this is actually an interesting doctrine in a lot of different ways. Some people consider that uh, you're a cult if you don't uh, have a certain view of, of something. I'd like to read something again from uh, the Sister of Nativity, uh, Jean LaRoyer. And this is what she wrote in the 18th century, or stated. When the reign of Antichrist draws near, a false religion will appear which will deny the unity of God and will oppose the church. So first of all, what is the unity of God according to Catholic sources? Well, here's something from uh, the Catholic Encyclopedia. Three persons that are one omnipotent God in whom the apostles believed. Indeed, the unity of God is so fundamental. So you're calling the Trinitarian idea the unity of God. And here's something from the fundamentals of Catholic dogma. The unity and trinity of God. The numerical unity or identity of the divine nature in three persons is indicated in the Trinitarian formulas. So first of all, they're saying that toward the time of the end, some religion will rise up. This religion will deny their Trinitarian formula. Now, perhaps I should mention to people who are not familiar with this, while the Catholic source indicated that the apostles actually believed in some kind of the tr trinity this way. That's simply not the case. The Trinitarian formula, essentially the one that was adopted by the Greco-Roman Protestant churches, was adopted in 381 AD at the Council of Constantinople. Prior to that, uh, even according to the Catholic Encyclopedia, many, particularly in uh, the Eastern regions, the Eastern Orthodox regions, which we recalled at that time, were, quote, semi-Aryan or Vinitarian. Most did not believe in the Trinity. Most Greco-Roman priests and bishops did not believe in the Trinity. In the early 4th uh, 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 century, early to mid-4th century, now the, the Roman Catholics will say that that's just Eastern Orthodox, but that they always believed in the uh, uh, Trinitarian formula, but that's actually simply not the case. The one the Catholic Encyclopedia calls the most important theologian prior to the Council of Nicaea was an individual by the name of Hippolytus of Rome. And the Roman bishop Hippolytus was considered a ditheist. He was called a ditheist. Um, most people who profess Christ did not have what is now considered to be the Trinitarian formula. They didn't, they, that, was not, that was simply not church doctrine. If you want more proof about that, again, I would urge you to read our uh, free booklet, The Continuing History of Church of God, as well as related references, and there's other articles at the cogwriter.com website if you want more depth on that. Now, the other part of uh, Jean LaRoyer's prophecy is says, a false religion will appear which will deny the unity of God and oppose the church. I received an email a while back uh, saying that... Uh, our church just appeared in the 21st century or through Herbert Armstrong or whatever appeared in the 20th century. We don't have ties to the original church, which is not true. If you look through church history, you can find that throughout the history as a church age, people have had Church of God doctrine. And the true church has always been Church of God. But they don't call, go that way. They, a lot of people say, oh no, your religion just appeared. Uh, sometimes, again, they call it things like Armstrongism, or they'll just say, the continuing Church of God you only incorporated a few years ago, therefore you have to be, uh, you, just, you just appeared. So as far as a lot of the Greco-Romans are going to be concerned, we did just appear, but that's because they're overlooking church history. And the biblical signs that Jesus said, and other writers that you could use to identify where the true church was. So this is a concern... Now, what's this got to do with uh, this Antichrist and Jesus? Well, let me read something from Athanasius. He was a fairly disgusting person, but because he was such an advocate of the Trinity, 
a lot of his faults have been overlooked. Anyway, from the fourth century, it says, but whereas one heresy, and that the last, which has now risen as a harbinger of, harbinger of Antichrist, the Arian, as it is called. So in other words, Athanasius was saying, toward the end, the big heresy is going to go up is some version of Arianism as opposed to Trinitarianism. Uh, Cardinal Newman said that uh, Athanasius was calling Arianism the forerunner of Antichrist. And then he cites some others. Then here's something from Richard Roll of Hampel, who died in 1349, many centuries ago. It says, after the destruction of Rome, and the Bible talks about Rome being destroyed in Revelation uh, uh, 19, amongst other places, Antichrist will appear and exalt himself above pagan deities in the Trinity. Well, when Jesus appears, certainly he's going to exalt himself above pagan deities and the Trinity because Jesus was not Trinitarian. Coming to Jerusalem, he'll pro proclaim himself Christ and at first pretend to be holy. He'll succeed through false preaching, miracles, gifts, terror, aided by the devil. He's going to pretend or feign of resurrection, cause rain to fall, Stone image, cause stone images to, to speak, perform other wonders, all through the power of devil. The Jews will welcome him. Now, this idea that Arianism or semi-Arianism was going to be around at the end is something that the Catholics have warned about. Now, what is semi-Arianism? I'd like to read something from the uh, Panorion of Epi Epiphanius. Uh, Salamis, and he wrote in the late 4th century, he says, semi-Arians hold the truly orthodox view of the sun. So in other words, those of us he calls semi-Arians, he said we have the right view of the sun. And he was uh, forever with the Father. But those who, they blaspheme the uh, Holy Spirit and they don't ta count him in the Godhead with the Father and the Son. Okay, that's his definition of semi-Arians. Well, during the time of uh, Epiphanius, a lot of the Greco-Roman, especially the Greek side of this, uh, were, uh, until they were told they couldn't be. Basically, after 381, Emperor uh, Theodosius said, you couldn't call yourself Catholic if you were in Trinity. We were not Trinitarian. So he basically put an edict out that all the Catholics had to be Trinitarian. And they all went along with this. Now, Arianism, there's two different versions of it. One version is uh, that Jesus was not God, and that, of course, is always wrong. Another version of Arianism said that uh, Jesus was God or became God or something. We, in the continuing Church of God, believe that Jesus was always God. Uh, he literally became the Son when he was born, uh, and that the Father and the Son are God. But this is a view that's been warned against. And again, uh, uh, Jean de Royer said that just before Antichrist comes, there's some religion is going to pop up who teaches this kind of stuff. And we, the continuing Church of God, teach this. And when Jesus returns, he's going to teach that uh, the Father is God and that he is God. He's not going to teach the Holy Spirit is God. So he will exalt himself above the Trinity as far as Moses' Catholic prophecies are, are concerned. Now, another doctrine that some hold is that we in the continuing church of God we faithful are actually supporters of Antichrist really? yes now we're small and you think they wouldn't care so much but let me look at this, this is, I'm going to read something from the Catholic Catechism this is the Catholic Catechism of the Catholic Church this is the one with the imprimatur of a uh, Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger, the one who later became uh, Pope Benedict XVI. This is number 676. It says, The Antichrist deception already begins to take place in the world every time the claim is made to realize within history that messianic hope which can only be realized beyond history through the eschatological judgment. The Catholic Church has rejected even modified forms of this falsification of the kingdom to come under the name of millenarianism, especially the intrinsically perverse political form of secular 
uh, messianism. So what the Catholic Encyclopedia, not the Catholic Encyclopedia, the Catholic Catechism says, teaching any version of the millennium, thousand year reign, is the doctrine of Antichrist. As a matter of fact, it's the only doctrine of Antichrist in the current catechism of the Catholic Church. Now, yes, there's other doctrines of Antichrist the Catholics believe will pop up, and I've read some. Uh, Pope Gregory the Great, if you will, said it's going to be the Sabbath. Various other ones said it would be idolatry, but it's interesting, the millennial one, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, that the millennial kingdom of God is the solution to humankind's problems, is considered to be the doctrine of Antichrist, and that's something... What do we in the continuing church of God preach? The gospel of the kingdom of God. Because Jesus is going to return and establish his kingdom on this earth. And they're saying that's the doctrine of Antichrist. Now I'd like to read something else that uh, Cardinal Ratzinger wrote. Uh, he said, Both Kiliism, which is a type of teaching millennium, Kiliism has to do a thousand years, and Montanism were declared heretical and were excluded from the universal, the Catholic Church, for they both denied some the vision, Christ the end of the age, and waited for another period of more definitive salvation to follow after the age of Christ. So you've got the Pope, or the former Pope, the person who became the former Pope, going around saying that you shouldn't believe in keeping the millennium, and it's not, it's not something that's going to happen. Well, Revelation, I'm going to go to Revelation 20, but I'm going to read first before I go there, uh, Revelation uh, 1, verse 11. Let me get over here so we can find this here. See what uh, Jesus told the Apostle uh, John. What you see, Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. And they go and they list them. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 20. So Jesus told John to write down what he saw. Well, did he see anything to do with the millennium? Yes, Revelation chapter 20. We start to see this. So then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon and the serpent of old, who's called devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. But we've never had a time in history so far, we've had a thousand year time where Jesus, or excuse me, where Satan was gone. We have not had that. We're looking forward to this coming. He was cast in the bottomless pit, shut him in there, sealed him so he should deceive the nations no more until a thousand years were finished. We've not had a thousand years where Satan hasn't been deceiving people. Now, verse 4. I saw on the thrones those who sat on them, and judgment was given to them, and I saw the souls of those who were beheaded for their witness to Jesus and the word of God. They hadn't worshipped the beast or his image. These people were not idolaters. Didn't have his mark on their forehead or their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead didn't lived a thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection. We see it's last a thousand years, the millennium. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection over such a second death has no power. And they shall be priests with, of God and of Christ and they shall reign with him a thousand years. The millennial period of time is spoken about in the Bible. Jesus told the Apostle John to write down what you see. And what he saw was a thousand year time where there's no Satan deceiving the world. Jesus and his saints reigning on the earth for a thousand years. But that's, we're told, we're being told that this is a doctrine of Antichrist. Here's another warning that, that uh, Catholic prophecy has about this stuff. This is uh, from Dionysius of uh, or Dion, yeah, Dionysius of Luxembourg again. It says, Antichrist will read people's minds, raise the dead, reward his followers, and punish the rest. Well, I just read Revelation chapter 20, and we see that Jesus' followers are going to be resurrected. Uh, Jesus can read minds. The Bible doesn't say Antichrist can read minds. We don't know what kind of signs and lying wonders Antichrist is going to do, for sure. Well, some of them are mentioned, but, but we know that Jesus can read, will be able to read minds and raise the dead and reward his followers. That's what we just read. 
Now here's an interesting one from Hildegard of Bingham again. Immediately preceding Antichrist, there'll be starvation and earthquakes. Antichrist will make the earth move, level mountains, dry up rivers, produce thunders, lightnings, and hail. Okay. Well, what's going to happen near the time just before Jesus comes? I'm going to read from the Apocalypse, Revelation, chapter 16. I've got it two different translations, but for the sermon I'd like to read from the uh, Reims New Testament, the Catholic translation. It says, And the sixth angel sounded, poured his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and dried up the water to make the way may be prepared for the kings of the rising of the sun. Verse 17. Seventh angel poured out his vial in the air, and there came forth a loud voice in the temple, saying, It's done. And there were made lightnings, voices, and thunders, and a great earthquake. Well, Hill, the guard of Bingham says this is what's going to happen before Antichrist comes. But the Bible says this is what's going to happen before Jesus comes. As none has never been since men were upon the earth. The earthquake so great. The great city was made into three parts. The cities of Gentiles fell. Babylon came in the memory before God to give her the cup of wine, the wrath of his, his indignation, his wrath, and every island fled, and the mountains were not found. And great hail. Like a talent came down from heaven upon men, and men blaspheming God for the plague and the hail. That's going to happen. Yet, the Catholic Saint Hildegard of Bingham, Sweden, said, This happens just before Antichrist comes. No! Antichrist is currently around. Well, when this happens, Antichrist will still be alive. The final Antichrist will be on the earth at the time. And Jesus is going to come afterward. Now, I intentionally skipped Revelation 16, 13 through 16. And we get to that then. So we can go over there. John wrote that he saw three unclean spirits, like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet. There are spirits of demons performing signs. They go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them, to the battle of the great day of all God Almighty. Behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and see his shame. And they gathered them to a place in Hebrew called Armageddon. Okay? So something's going to happen with Armageddon. Yet another Catholic, I think she's now considered a saint, Anne Catherine Emmerich, who died in 1824, says Antichrist will fight a successful battle at Megiddo in Palestine, after which seven rulers from fear will subject themselves to Antichrist, and he will afterward become Lord of the world. Now, commenting about the above, from the old radio church of God, a guy by the name of David John Hill, in his article, Christ or Antichrist, wrote, again, this is about Emmerich's comment I just read, quote, it's impossible to see how they could believe this, but there it is. Compare this with Revelation 19.19. In other words, he's like, how could that, that be? I would also comment that, and I should have written this down, that the Eastern Orthodox also have a prophecy, basically, uh, that suggests that Babylon is good and who, the wrong side wins in Armageddon. Now, here's another writing. Now, before I go further, you know, the Bible in Revelation 19, verses 19 to 20, shows that Jesus ends up winning the battle that's related to the armies that are staged in Armageddon, not Antichrist. So understand, when Jesus wins, people are going to point to some of these prophecies and say, look, that must be the Antichrist. Even though the Bible, the book they should be looking at, the Bible comes up with a different conclusion. Uh, here's one from their venerable Maria Agrita. She said, The kings will send armies to the Holy Land, but Antichrist will slay them all. Well, who wins? I mentioned Revelation 19. Let's go there. It says, Then I saw an angel standing, starting verse 17, standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come, gather together for the supper of the great God. You'll eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses. Flesh of people, small and great. I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and the armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and his army. 
So people are going to fight against Jesus Christ. But there's a prophecy that the kings are going to go to the armies of the Holy Land, Antichrist wins. But the Bible says Jesus wins. Verse 20, Then the beast was captured, with him the false prophet, who worked signs in his presence. This is the end of the Antichrist, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two were cast live in a lake burning with fire and brimstone. Okay, so we find out that Jesus wins the battle that's associated with Armageddon. The Antichrist gets destroyed. Yet Satan has had prophets and prophetesses write the opposite's going to happen. That's the Antichrist that wins. Would you believe Jesus or the Antichrist? Venerable Bartholomew Holzhauser, who died in 1658, wrote that the sixth epoch from the, of the church is going to be from the great monarch until the Antichrist. This is the time of consolation. It begins with the holy pope and powerful emperor and terminates with the reign of Antichrist. What Catholic prophecy actually teaches is at the time of the end there's going to be, they're calling us a holy pope and a powerful emperor. Basically, the beast and the false prophet are going to rise up. And the Bible warns against them, but they have it the reverse. They have it that the, something that's not in the Scripture, that a holy pope and powerful emperor rise up, and they're there until Antichrist rises up. And that's not true. I just read from Revelation 19 that the beast and the false prophet get destroyed when Jesus comes. And that ends the, end, ends the reign of Antichrist. Now, some Catholics, of course, realize who wins in Armageddon. Here's something from, uh, that was published in 1920 from the Interpretation of the Apocalypse. Armageddon is a Greek word for Her Megiddo, Mount Megiddo, a place often drenched with Israel's blood. The defeat of Antichrist may be accomplished on this very battleground. So although some Catholic writings have the opposite conclusion, some have the correct biblical one. The Bible is clear that a power from Rome is going to be destroyed. Let's go to Revelation 17. Starting in verse uh, 4. I'm going to read this from the Reims New Testament. And a woman was clothed brown with purple and scarlet and gilded with gold, uh, cardinals were scarlet, and precious stone and pearls, and having a golden cup in her hand full of abomination and filthiness of her fornication. And in her forehead a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of, fornic of the fornications and abominations of the earth. I saw a woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And I marveled when I saw her with great admiration. The angel said to me, Why do you marvel? I'll tell you the mystery. And Go down to verse 9. Here's understanding has wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills upon which the woman sits. These are seven kings. If you go to the last verse of that particular uh, chapter, it said that it's the city that rules over the world. The seven city, seven hills that rules over the world, the only one that did historically was, to that degree, was Rome. Some have claimed Constantinople, but was Rome without going through all the Catholic writings, there's a lot of Catholic writings that say that this is against Rome. Uh, and so, and they, they know that uh, Rome is what's being talked about. Now, if you go to Revelation chapter uh, uh, 18, I'd like to read, uh, starting in verse 2, it says, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great, it's become a habitation of devils, the custody of every unclean spirit, the custody of every unclean and hateful bird, because the nations, all the nations have drunk of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of earth have fornicated with her, and the merchants of the earth were made rich by virtue of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, God, up from her, my people, that you would not be partakers of her sins and receive not her plagues, because her sins are coming to heaven. And God remembered her iniquities. We're not supposed to be part of 
this. We're not supposed to be deceived by what's going to happen. But the Bible shows most people will not recognize Jesus Christ. Many will think that Jesus, the returning Jesus Christ is the Antichrist based on a lot of different writings and misunderstandings of Scripture. You say, well, I'm, let's say you're a Protestant. Say, so I'm a Protestant. I don't believe these Catholic prophecies. That's fine. You can, uh, even as Roman Catholics are not required to believe Roman Catholic prophecies. But there's a high probability you probably believe the Trinity. There's a high probability that you probably don't think you should go to church on Saturday and keep the Sabbath. There's a high probability you don't think you need to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. There's a high probability that uh, you consider crosses to be an acceptable icon, etc., etc., etc. So there's, there's a lot of things that the Catholics are warning that Antichrist will have that apply to Jesus. Who you know. Now, one of the claims, warnings against the Antichrist, is going to claim to be the Messiah. This is from Venerable Bartholomew Holshauser again. Antichrist will come as the Messiah. The Jews, knowing that from the Bible that Jerusalem will be the seed of the Messiah, will come from everywhere and accept Antichrist as Messiah. And certainly when Jesus comes, he's going to claim to be the Messiah. He didn't first time. He's going to come, when he comes the second time, he's going to do that. Now there's a couple of interesting uh, prophecies. One of the reasons why people will not believe it's Jesus that returns is that because there are certain Catholic prophecies that say there will be a cross. At least there's one or two that it will be a cross in the sky preceding the return of Jesus Christ. So let me read this one. This is from uh, uh, the late uh, French Catholic Cardinal uh, Jean uh, Gionole Marie uh, Danielou. My French is horrible, so I'm sorry for those who understand French. Uh, and this comes from various uh, books, which even the Church of Rome says is not are not... Uh, canonical like the Apocalypse of Peter and the Epistle of the Apostles, none of which are in the Bible. They're not in the Catholic Bible, not in the Protestant Bible, not in the Church of God Bible. Anyway, but this is a belief that some have. It says, just as the cross accompanied Christ in his ascent to heaven, so will precede him at his coming again. This is what this cardinal wrote. Well, there's two problems with that. There's at least two problems with that. First of all, there was no cross associated with uh, Jesus going into heaven. You can read about Jesus' ascent into heaven in Acts chapter 1. It doesn't talk anything about a cross. So you say, okay, well, maybe before that, because Jesus was crucified on the cross or killed on the cross. Well, that's not what this, the Greek says. The Greek says it was a pole. People can argue whether or not there was a cross point over it or not, but the Bible never actually uses the term for, for cross in that respect. The, the New Testament doesn't say anything about a cross. It talks about a pole. It's also called, the, it's also called a tree. So it says that's problem number one. And the second problem is that early Christians didn't keep early Christians didn't have crosses, etc. Now I'd like to read something from uh, Cyril of Jerusalem, who's an Eastern Orthodox bishop. He says, "But what's the sign of his coming? That a hostile power dare to counterfeit it, and it shall appear." He says, "The sign of the Son of Man in heaven." Now Christ's own true sign is the cross. A sign of his luminous cross shall go before the king, plainly declaring him who is formerly crucified, etc., etc., etc. And they consider this to be the sign of the Son of Man appearing in the uh, heavens. It's going to be a cross. But the Bible doesn't say that. It does say about the sign of the Son of Man coming, but it doesn't say anything about a cross. Yet, some non-biblical books claim it, and... An Eastern Orthodox uh, uh, bishop in the fourth century uh, wrote about it, and so people are going to expect that to happen. When there is no cross coming with Jesus, because the Bible doesn't say there'd be a cross coming with Jesus, people are going to claim he is the Antichrist, and he will not have had the signs, because people do not know what this book says. The uh, God is spirit, and those uh, who worship him are supposed to worship him in spirit and in truth. And the truth is, the Bible doesn't say that Jesus was killed on the cross. Acts 1 does not say Jesus ascended with the cross. 
And Matthew 24 does not say that Jesus is coming back with a cross. Yet, that's what many of them claim are going to happen. Now, most people are aware that when Jesus returns, he's going to resurrect the saints. Uh, for example, uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, uh, 2.16, reading from the Catholic Rames New Testament, says, For our Lord himself, in, in commandment, and in a voice, the archangel, and in the trumpet of God, will descend from heaven, and the dead that are in Christ will rise again first. Actually, this should be 4.16. Okay, anyway. Also, I read uh, Revelation uh, 4, that the dead will be raised. So we know that that says that that's going to happen. However, there's some apparition, a Catholic-approved apparition, from someone who supposedly claimed to be Mary. She appeared in La Salle at France in uh, 1846. It says, Some will make the dead arise and appear to be holy persons. Such persons resurrected through the agency of demons shall assume the figure of holy persons in order to more easily deceive them. These self-styled styled res resuscitated persons shall be nothing but demons under their, their forms. In this way they shall preach a gospel contrary to that of Jesus Christ, denying the existence of heaven. Now this is interesting for several different points. So what this apparition is claiming is that there's going to be a resurrection, when the Bible says there will be, and that the people who will be resurrected, some of them will appear to be saints, that the Catholics recognize, but she says they won't be. And they're going to say they were not in heaven. Why? Because when people die, what, are they, what happens to them? They fall asleep. We have articles about that at the cogwriter.com website. We have a sermon or two on it at the Continuing COG uh, channel. But basically, these people, when they're resurrected, are going to say they didn't go to heaven, except, well, for the... Not, not in the sense that they've been in heaven for hundreds or thousands of years. For example, let's say somebody who will be resurrected would be Polycarp of Smyrna. Now, he's considered to be a saint by the continuing Church of God, uh, by other Church of God, some of the, most other Church of God groups, I think. Uh, uh, the Protestants, the Eastern Orthodox, and Roman Catholics all consider him a saint. When he's resurrected, he's not going to say, well, for 18, 1900 years, I was in heaven. No, he's going to deny he was in heaven. And they've got a prophecy to warn about this. And basically, this apparition said that this is all demonic, don't believe it. So you would think, even after the resurrection of the dead, that people would accept what was going on. But Satan's got a plan for people to continue to fight against Jesus Christ and the saints when they return. Now, I mentioned before that uh, the old Radio Church of God uh, knew about this. I'll read a few things from a, an article. It says, Satan knows God's general plan. He's been at work in the minds of evil and deluded men throughout the ages to lay the groundwork of the great delusion. And that's what I've been saying. Since at least the 4th century, we see prophecies coming out, getting people to get ready to fight against the returning Jesus Christ, to consider him to be the Antichrist. Now, Satan may have had some prophecies inspired Prior to this, that uh, we just haven't, haven't seen, there are a couple of things, I think, from the 3rd century that I believe also uh, support this. And there may be some from the 2nd century, but most of the ones that I've been going through today are from the 4th century uh, through uh, the 20th, 21st century. Now here's a, a Catholic prophecy. It says, Toward the end of the world, Antichrist will overthrow the Pope and usurp his see. Well, we know when Jesus returns, the false prophet's gone. The false prophet who's associated with the city of Seven Hills will be gone. Uh, here's another one. Antichrist's army will conquer Rome, kill the Pope, and take the throne. And this, again, this I'm reading from an article uh, by David John Hill uh, from the old uh, Radio Church of God. He says, When these false prophecies are read from the pulpits in the ears of the gullible people, and they begin to see God's intervention come to pass, they, they, the whole earth and sea will, uh, will believe that 
The only meaning they've ever heard about these things is that this has got to do with the Antichrist. They won't believe it's Jesus. And he says a more modern uh, prophet, Catholic prophecy, says whole nations are going to join their church just before the reign of Antichrist. Well, the Bible warns that people are going to be deceived by the signs and lying wonders. And uh, we'll get to that uh, in a little bit. It says, because they will not admit the truth, the Catholic Church believes the Antichrist will be the one who unseats the Pope. While every Bible prophecy commissions the true Jesus Christ with that job. So continuing through this article, it says, So we see here the diabolical plot hatched by this professed Christian leader. Here is an age-old attempt of Satan the devil to arrogate himself and to his deceived minions, the office of God, where he attributes the intervention of the true Christ in his returning glory to the person and action of Antichrist. This is from an article, Will You Be Deceived by Antichrist? Good News Magazine of 1964. Again, this is at the cogwriter.com website. Now, the old Radio Church of God used to teach this. It was preached in the uh, 1960s. I heard it preached in the early 1980s. Uh, one, I've been, although I've been planning on doing this sermon for some time, what uh, triggered me to do it now is that there was another Church of God group, somebody not associated with, with us, who actually used my article in the sermon, put up on a projector lots of the uh, quotes from, from my article, and was warning other Church of God people, look, people are going to be deceived by Satan's plan. People are going to think that Jesus Christ is the Antichrist, and they're kind of going against, they're against Church of God doctrine and Church of God teachings. They actually sent me a DVD of, of that. So anyway, I saw that. Some have occasionally indicated that I've used... I've mentioned Catholic prophecies a little too often. It would be your own opinion. But I'd like to read something that the late Herbert W. Armstrong wrote from his book, The Mystery of the Ages, pages 306-307. He said, Christ is coming. Will humanity shout with joy and welcome him in frenzied ecstasy and enthusiasm? Will even the churches of traditional Christianity? They will not. They'll believe because of false ministers of Satan, 2 Corinthians 11, 13-15, who will have deceived them that he is the Antichrist. Well, Herbert Armstrong knew about these Catholic prophecies because he had them published a couple of times in magazines that he was the editor-in-chief of. Anyway, he also says the churches and the nations will be angry at his coming. Revelation 11, 15, 11, 18. So Herbert Armstrong saw how these Catholic prophecies tied in with biblical ones. It helps explain why people are going to be deceived, why people will fight against Jesus Christ when he returns. He says the military forces are actually going to attempt to fight him and destroy him. It says in Revelation 17, 14. The nations will be engaged in a climactic battle of the coming World War III and with a battlefront at Jerusalem, Zechariah 14. And then Christ will return in supernatural power. He'll fight against those nations. They'll fight against him. He'll totally defeat them, Revelation 17, 14. His feet will stand on that day in the Mount of Olives, very short distance east of Jerusalem, Zechariah 14, 14. The reality is, because people have accepted some of these mystic visions, and there will be other mystic visions and signs. Signs are going to be very powerful. And those who do not have the full love of the truth will be deceived by them. Uh, let's go to 2 Corinthians uh, 11. Herbert Armstrong alluded to them. I'd like to actually read a couple of verses from there. Cutting into verse 12, I will also continue to do that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the things which they boast. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And some of them consider they have apostolic succession. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves, transform themselves into angels ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Many false prophets have risen up and claim to be part of the true church. When they contradict scripture, do not believe them. 
Will people believe the beast and the false prophet? Sees yes. Let's go to Second Thessalonians chapter two. Starting in verse seven. Even as far back as the Apostle Paul's time, something was going on. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. So it was already starting then, but notice there was a restraint. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. So there's been restraint stopping Satan from having certain signs and wonders appear. But that's going to change. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So Jesus is going to destroy this lawless one. The lawless one teaches that you don't have to keep all the Ten Commandments, combines a couple of them together, doesn't think uh, idolatry is wrong, doesn't think you should go to church on Saturday, uh, thinks... Uh, Killing in various ways is uh, acceptable, especially with uh, the military and uh, through the church, through their church, etc. The lawless one, coming to the lawless ones according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, including these false prophecies, and with all unrighteous deception, that definitely includes the false prophecies, the private prophecies, among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Will you believe the lie? Will you be able to know who Jesus Christ is as opposed to Antichrist? That they may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. I hope if you watch this, you will not be at all offended by it. I'm not trying to offend anyone. I want people to study their Bibles and believe what it says. Let me comment that as one who's read lots of books on Catholic prophecies, some of the Catholic prophecies are right, uh, but some are wrong. Some are mirror images of Scripture. Some are going to deceive people and are going to fight against Jesus Christ. I'd like to read uh, certain contradictory Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox writings or prophecies, or just a summary. They're Verse 14, about Antichrist. They teach that Antichrist is going to cite scriptures as proof of his messiahship. Well, we know Jesus is going to do that. Number two, he'll keep and promote the seventh-day Sabbath. Well, Jesus did before. He will do it again. Three, he'll teach against idols and an idol-related mass. Well, Jesus was opposed to idols before. It will be again. Four, we'll teach the Catholic religion is false. Jesus is going to teach whatever doesn't agree with the Bible is false. Oh, there's a Catholic prophecy that the Antichrist is going to uh, change the Ten Commandments. Well, Jesus is going to renumber the Ten Commandments. Uh, the Roman Catholics number the Ten Commandments differently than the Church of God, the Protestants, the Eastern Orthodox, all of which number them the same way. The Roman Catholics combine the First and Second Commandment into one commandment, and they split the uh, Tenth Commandment into two. That's how they come up with ten. But they have a prophecy that the Antichrist is going to change the Ten Commandments. Well, Jesus will insist on the correct uh, Ten Commandments, or properly numbered Ten Commandments. And by the way, if you look at early church writings, including Greco-Roman writings, you'll find the Ten Commandments were listed out the same way uh, we in the Continuing Church of God teach them, as well as the Greek Orthodox and the Protestants. So obviously Jesus would continue the same way. Well, number six, they say the Antichrist will be Jewish. We know Jesus is going to be Jewish. Number seven, Antichrist, they say, will observe Jewish rites, but we know even the Catholic translation of the Bible says when Jesus comes back in Zechariah, the Feast of Tabernacles is going to be kept. Number eight. It says the Antichrist will have supporters who treat against, teach against the Trinity. Well, the early church did not accept or teach the Greco-Roman Trinity. That came uh, into the uh, Church of Rome uh, basically started in the uh, uh, second century with some with, a, with two people who were heretics according to the Church of Rome and then eventually got adopted uh, in the 4th century. If number nine, they say Antichrist is going to teach the millennial gospel of the kingdom. Well, Jesus is going to teach the gospel of the kingdom of the millennium. He's the one that had the Apostle Paul, he's the Apostle John write about it. Number ten, they say Antichrist is going to preach that there's a coming future opportunity for salvation. 
Well, Jesus is going to teach that. I didn't go into that in this particular sermon, but Jesus talked about the age to come. And we have an article on apocalyptostasis, I know it's a very long Greek word, where I've listed hundreds of scriptures in the Bible to support this idea. Number 11, they say the Antichrist comes after thunders, lightnings, earthquakes, and mountains being leveled in great hail. Yet the book of Revelation says that comes while Antichrist is alive, and that Jesus comes after that. They say that uh, number 12, that the Antichrist wins the Battle of Armageddon, as it's so-called. Well, that battle that staged Armageddon, according to the Bible, Jesus wins. Number 13, they say Antichrist comes after the destruction of the Roman Empire. Well, the Bible says Jesus will be involved in the destruction of the Roman Empire and he will come. Number 14 says Antichrist will claim to be the Messiah. The Bible doesn't say the Antichrist will claim to be the Messiah. Uh, he, 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 he may or may not. But Jesus certainly will. Oh, and there's a 15th. I said I was only going to go through 14, but there's actually a 15. And that is, he will, Antichrist will have those that appear to be resurrected saints with him. Well, we know that the Bible says Jesus will have the resurrected saints uh, uh, with him. Let's go to Revelation chapter 11. I'm just going to read one verse. When Jesus comes, are people going to be happy? Most of the world be happy? Not according to the Bible. It says, And the nations were angry. Verse 18 of Revelation 11. And your wrath has come. The time of the dead that they should be judged. You should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. And I already alluded to Revelation 19.19, 19, that uh, the beasts and the kings of the earth and the armies were those who made war against them ended up being destroyed. Satan has had his plan for a long time. Many of you will think you will, you will not be deceived by it, but if you accept false doctrine, if you don't believe you should be keeping the seventh-day Sabbath, if you don't believe you should be keeping God's holy days, if you do believe in the Greco-Roman Trinitarian formula, which was not held by the early Christians, not taught in the Bible, if you accept those type of doctrines, you do not have the love of the truth and you will be deceived by Antichrist. Now if you have or wonder about that, study more. You can repent, you can learn more. So you don't have to be deceived. When Jesus comes back, will you really know if he's Jesus Christ or the Antichrist? If you're not sure, study. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God channel.